I wanted to start with some case. We're, we're going to do this in a case study format. I'm going to take the first half and then Mike is going to take the second half. Um, we've turned off the lens um, just to make it easier. The Q and typing questions into the Q&A section. And I've got a slide at the end of my presentation to try and address those Q&A questions um, before I, I uh, hand over the mic to, uh, to Mike. Um, and so, um, now I'm moving forward here. So let's start with the first case. This is Tucker. Tucker's an eight month old, Coton de Tulier who fell out of his owner's arms uh, with an acute uh, resulting non-weight bearing lameness in the right hind leg, which is kind of unusual. When I read that, I always think that they're gonna have a broken radius and ulna. So, but in this case, it was a hind limb lameness. Um, the referring vet made note of uh, mild bruising medially, but the cranial thrust and cranial drawer were negative and the kneecap was normal. So um, the x-rays basically showed this um, tibial tubercle avulsion in this puppy. Um, so uh, the reason why this is, falls under the category of an FAQ is basically one of the questions I think a lot of vets have when they call us um, uh, with their x-rays is they, uh, they say, well, when are these cases surgical and when are these cases non-surgical? When, when do we need to refer this case and when do we not re need to refer this case? Um, and there's a lot of factors that go into that decision making. Sometimes it's the age of the dog. Sometimes it's how long ago the fracture occurred. Um, but one of the biggest factors probably is basically how much this tubercle is actually displaced. Um, uh, you can imagine from a biomechanical perspective that this tubercle is displaced far enough that it, it's basically held on by this patellar tendon. Um, and basically if this pulls up too far, then this kneecap will in turn also become a patella alta and displace proximally. And if it displaces too far proximally to its own trochlear groove, then it's prone to luxating medially or laterally. So that would be a clear indicator that this fracture would need to be repaired is if you can actually palpate a concurrent um, patella luxation, whether it's medial or lateral, then that's definitely probably one that needs to be operated. Or basically, if you take your x-ray and you see that this fragment's actually kind of way up here, then there's no question. There's no conservative treatment for that surgery, for that fracture, you probably should refer it for surgical intervention so we can pull that back down into its normal position and fix it in place with a couple of pins. Um, I deliberately picked this one case where it was a bit of a tweener, where it's nebulous, you know? I mean, if this case, if this, uh, tubercle stays where it belongs and mother nature heals it in position, the dog's actually probably going to be just fine, um, which brings up the concern that depending on the client and their risk tolerance, if the dog can be totally restricted um, and maybe this fragment won't have the opportunity to displace any further, uh, then certainly they could uh, pursue a non-surgical management approach. You do get some clients that are a little concerned that they're not going to be able to restrict their dog adequately or they start off restricting their dog adequately, but then the dog does escape confinement and now the lameness is worse, um, then it is wise to get another set of x-rays and see if this fragment actually displaced any further. In fact, that's not a bad idea anyway. If you're gonna pursue a conservative management approach with a case like this, to set up a set of x-rays, maybe some arbitrary time after the first set of x-rays, maybe three to five days, maybe up to a week after the first set of x-rays, um, depending on how quickly the dog is growing. Um, which is obviously dependent on the dog's age, uh, you know, say anywhere from three days to a week's time, get another set of x-rays just to verify that that fragment is still in the same position and hasn't moved. Um, and if that's the case, then they're almost home free to continue with conservative management, um, uh, but they do need to enforce the activity restriction. Now, in this case, sometimes the clients want to add the repair in there just by virtue of the adding some comfort to the idea that their dog isn't going to allow that fragment to displace any further. Sometimes the case is subacute enough that, there, that the space where the fracture was is now filled with some granulation tissue and that limits my ability um, to get the fragment back down to where it belongs, which is still fine. It, uh, this, you know, it, 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 these pins will still allow it to heal in a reasonable position um, and, uh, and assure the client that it's not gonna pull out any further during the restriction period. 
Uh, of course, that's my explanation for this radiograph. There was too much granulation tissue in there. It possibly couldn't be my surgical skill and prowess in getting that fragment down to where it belongs. Um, but that being said, there are multiple ways that you can skin this cat, basically. So you could, you know, there are different, different avenues depending on a client's risk tolerance that they could take. Another thing about this is that um, depending on the age of the dog, we also do make efforts to remove these pins um, if the dog has a lot of growth potential left. Um, you know, for example, in a four month old Great Dane, I'm almost certainly going to want to take those pins out um, to allow that growth plate, um, to preserve that growth plate and allow it um, its due ability to contribute the rest of its growth. Whereas in this small breed dog, you know, at this age, I might be actually more inclined just to leave those pins in there because, you know, there's not much more of the, the growth plate that I'm still trying to preserve to, you know, and I don't want to put the dog through unnecessary second surgery if I don't have to. This contrasts, of course, to this kind of fracture where, um, where on this side is just the tibial tubercle, this side it's the tibial tubercle and the whole proximal physis. Um, in a lot of these cases, you know, it's, it's a similar calculus and they don't necessarily have Sorry guys, I apologize for keep losing connection here where we are troubleshooting our internet connection because uh, none of this of course was happening when we were doing the testing. So, um, but anyway, um, case like this by virtue of that steeper slope that they may, might end up with, we might actually push a little bit harder for surgical intervention earlier rather than later if possible. Um, if, if it is subacute and we can't get that thing rocked back into position, then at least the pins that we put in there uh, should hopefully uh, uh, prevent it from displacing any further. This is Zorro. Um, Zorro is a five month old border terrier and basically his story and history is pretty similar to the first. Um, it's just his x-rays are slightly different. Um, and then we put in these pins and then there's the possibility that we might have to take them out. Although again, in dog of this age, I think I did actually remove these pins in this dog. Uh, after it healed, that this is just a view of the, the AP view, just so you can see that you know all of those pins can actually be placed from a medial approach, um, and they do just fine. Um, and then this went on to heal just fine um, without any problems. And I did go in and remove those pins thereafter, just because the dog was young enough. Although there really, if you look at this X-ray, there's really not that much growth plate left to contribute. So I probably could have just as easily left those pins in there as well. Um, now, by contrast, you get a dog that, you know, that does a client that wants to pursue conservative management and in a case that's, that's well enough to pursue conservative management. Uh, this is the x-ray of a four month old puppy with a very slightly displaced uh, tibia tubercle. And then an x-ray a week later, just to show that it hadn't really drastically changed in position whatsoever. Now you may notice that there's a little bit more of a, a, a say what we, you might call osteolysis or a bigger gap here and it might give you the impression that the fragments actually displaced further um, where in reality it hasn't displaced you know that much at all uh, it's just that this area here has, is currently going through what we call the lytic phase um, of healing which is normal the lytic phase of healing is a normal period of time I don't know, anywhere from a third to a midway point of final healing of the bone where the body starts to break down the fracture site um, as a precursor to laying down new scaffolding um, and before it lays down new mineral. So um, this is a topic I'm gonna bring up a little bit later in, in my next case as well, but it's important to know and understand that a lytic phase of healing actually exists uh, just so that you don't freak out when you see this x-ray a little bit later and you think that there's something wrong with the bone. This is normal. This dog is successfully pursuing uh, conservative management for this fracture. So that kind of case, you don't necessarily need to refer. You certainly can say, hey, you could go to the surgeon if you want to feel more comfortable getting pins in there, or you can try conservative management, um, but just come back here three to five days from now so we can take a second set of x-rays and make sure that that fragment hasn't hasn't displaced any further. Um, so you can always do that. Let's move on to the next case. Case number two, Copper. Copper's a five-year-old male castrated boxer Doberman cross. Uh, I have to admit something to you. This is actually not Copper. Um, I didn't have a picture of Copper on hand, so I just pirated a picture off the internet of Copper, which is where this kind of website credit is due. Um, but that's if you can imagine, this is kind of what Copper probably would have looked like. Um, 
and uh, and Copper was hit by a car and uh, and and sustained a forelimb lameness. Uh, this isn't copper either, but I found this picture on the same website that I found this picture, and I just thought you guys might like to see it. That's definitely not copper. All right, so this uh, acute non-weight-bearing forelimb lameness, pain and crepitus in the metacarpal region. I think that that sort of kills the punchline right there. This is what the dog sustained. Um, for those of you that might have seen a newsletter that we put out, what is it, maybe like a couple, a few months ago, um, copper was the subject of that. Um, I think we actually um, did have copper's picture in that newsletter. I just couldn't really find it for the purposes of this talk. Um, but, you know, uh, that newsletter, it talks about all the criteria that we use to try and decide whether these are, are surgical or not surgical, which is why this is another FAQ. This is another one of those situations where we get a lot of questions um, from you guys with emails of toe fractures and metacarpal fractures, metatarsal fractures. When do you send them? When do you not send them? And once again, kind of like the previous case, a lot of it depends on the client's take on, um, on the things that you're telling them and their expectations of, of success. Um, all these criteria that have been brought up in the past in terms of like, well, are they weight bearing digits? You know, we're more likely to repair them if they're with the weight bearing digits here, you know, uh, three and four. Um, less likely to intervene if they're one, if they're two and five, or if they're just one metacarpal fracture or one digital fracture and the rest are intact, more likely just to heal with a splint alone. Um, how displaced is it? If it's not that far displaced, then maybe you could get away with splint management. Reality is, is none of those criteria have actually been truly verified scientifically um, and, and you get sort of mixed results. Um, and, uh, and there's even papers out there that show that nearly all these fractures certainly could heal with splint management alone. Um, but the key f word in that statement is could, you know, and so it's all about managing client expectation. We do tend to loosely apply those all those criteria that I mentioned, you know, if they are weight bearing digits, we're more likely to repair them. If there's multiple, like if they're three out of four or all four of them broken, then we're more likely to, to recommend repair. If they're really displaced, we're more likely to recommend repair. But in the end, you get a client that's resistant or quite frankly, a client that doesn't have the money to do it. You know, they don't need to lose all hope. You know, pursuit of conservative management might just still win out. Um, so if they really have no options, then that's still a good backup plan to try. But this is where I wanted to raise the issue of the um, lytic phase of bony healing. This is an adult. You can see the growth plates are closed. Um, and, uh, you know, you can't get healing in, in four weeks time like you can expect with a puppy. So, I mean, if you think of our controlled osteotomies or even our fractures, uh, we're getting, for example, our TPLOs, we're getting final x-rays of TPLOs at eight weeks after surgery. And that's, a, that's an osteotomy that you create and you fixate with the most stable repair we can come up with. And it takes eight weeks to heal. So the lytic phase, for example, for a TPLO, probably would be somewhere between, you know, week three and four uh, from the time of surgery. So if you were tempted to take an x-ray at four weeks after a TPLO, you'd probably see the, the osteotomy in smack dab in the middle of its lytic phase of bony healing. And if you were expecting it to be done healing at that time, you'd probably be freaking out because you see this big gap in the osteotomy. So I wanted to, to raise that issue here because a lot of the time you are certainly tempted to take an x-ray of your conservative management metacarpal fracture case one month after you've applied the splint. And that's totally fine to do. You send that you know, off for a radiology review, then the radiologist most certainly might call that a delayed union. Um, uh, but, and they are certainly correct, but what you might need to kind of put into perspective is that's a delayed union by your design. Um, you're expecting it to be a delayed union. So as far as I'm concerned, there might not actually be a functional reason to get your four week x-rays after you initiate splint management, because you're really only expecting the healing to be just initiating at that time. You know, whereas in the TPLO, we're expecting um, final healing to take eight weeks with a fixated fracture. With a non-fixated osteotomy or fracture, you can only expect that eight week period to be further delayed. So the lytic period is probably going to be right around four weeks, you know, so uh, that, that x-ray at the four week time after splint management initiation is almost always going to look worse um, than, uh, than 
then you might expect, you shouldn't expect it to be healed at four weeks. I might make the argument that it might not be worth getting any kind of check-in x-rays until you're expecting healing to be finished with that conservative management case. And that might be more along the lines of eight or 10 or 12 weeks post splint management initiation. And until you get to that eight or 12 week time period, you should be changing the splint every week to two weeks um, to tolerance of the dog. I mean, if you're running into bandage sores, then you'll just have to deal with those appropriately and you know accordingly. So maybe you'll have to abandon the splint management sooner than your eight or 10 week period. But at least, you know, I wouldn't make critical assessments on the success of that healing until you get out to the 10 or 12 week mark after the initiation of it. Now, in this particular scenario, um, we obviously chose to repair it. So we took x-rays um, at eight weeks after the, the surgery and found that it finished healing. And then we got to go in and get those pins out because they can't really walk uh, when you've got pins sticking out your uh, metacarpal phalangeal joint. So, so these pins that we put in, we do have to remove them uh, after bony healing was verified. Um, this uh, was another case where all of them were fractured, but not only, um, this was, I put this in here just so that you, to belabor the point of the need for orthogonal views, because this looks like they're mostly non-displaced. Pretty good argument to say you don't necessarily need to splint to, to operate. Maybe you can get away with splint management alone, but then you see that the bones aren't really talking to each other at all. Um, again, you know, you get a client in a pinch, maybe they can't really uh, afford surgery. It still might be reasonable to pursue non-surgical management, but this case we would argue would be better suited to a surgical stabilization. So. All right. Now, it's how often do we actually repair digits? Uh, phalanges. Um, I'm going to tell you the answer to that's almost never. Um, but here's a story of an eight-year-old greyhound that tried to jump into a car and failed. Um, and then so it sustained that digital fracture that you see. Um, but this dog had a lot of um, so comorbidities. You know, it had fractures, it had Achilles issues, and all of them, you know, in the end were actually successfully treated and the dog made a, you know, full recovery with all those previous injuries until this happened. Um, but then it kind of makes for the argument, well, shouldn't we, you know, try and give the dog his best leg to stand on, you know, pun intended, if we can help, let's try and fix it. There's not really a lot of great options for fixation of a digit um, because, I mean, even this fixation, it looks awesome radiographically. Um, surgeon did a great job. The, the problem with it is that it would be nice to have gotten more than four total cortices on this fracture of stabilization. So in, in some capacity that was sort of kind of tenuous at best, and this fracture did eventually kind of fall apart, but the good news is that it still went on to heal um, with a callus despite all of that. So, so there, I guess I would say that there are sometimes indications where we might consider it, but the reality is, is this dog could probably do fine with a digit amputation. Okay, and so sometimes it's important to let the client know that ahead of time because some clients don't wanna go through eight, 10, 12 weeks of splint changes. If they know an amputation's an option right up front, sometimes it's best just let them know that that's an option up front as well. All right, this is Rainer. Rainer is my last case, and I'm gonna pass it off to Dr. Tossin after we do our question and answers. Um, <clears throat> The, I guess it seems like all of my cases were all kind of juvenile patient or young, at least young. This is two-year-old male caster to Siberian. This really is Rainer. I did not pirate this picture off the internet. Um, he fell two stories. And uh, once again, surprisingly, I left Highland lameness as opposed to a forelimb lameness. Again, we're usually, you know, those high-rise cats, we're waiting, we're, we're expecting there to be jaw fractures and radius ulna fractures. But in this case, it was just a left rear fracture. Um, uh, trauma check on the chest and abdomen were normal, so move on to pelvic rads. Okay, I got to make an ad admission here. None of these three x-rays are Rainer's at all. Um, I just, uh, I'll show you Rainer's x-rays next, but I just wanted to show you and remind you guys, um, the reason this is under an FAQ um, for orthopedics is because I want to remind you guys to pick up on capital physeal fractures Sometimes you just need this, the frog leg view because the OFA style view has the ability to reduce that fracture and, and you may actually miss it on, your, on a beautiful OFA style view. So if you got a pretty severe lameness on a rear leg after a traumatic incident in a cat like that and you don't see anything on your extended view, 
I'd, in a juvenile cat that might still have open growth plates, I would still go ahead and try and get your frog leg view just to make sure that they don't have something like this going on. It is true, most of these cases, we are gonna go ahead and, and do an FHO. Um, for the radiologists out there, um, you probably made note that this isn't even a cat, this is a dog. Um, and in some of these cases, if we catch it early enough, we can go ahead and repair them. Um, but that does come with its own set of risks um, of failure and stuff like that. So the client has to be prepared for that. So it is possible to fix those in the acute phase. But of course, in Rayner's case, we, you know, we went with an FHO. It just turns out actually with Rayner's x-ray, you could pick up on the capital physeal fracture with an extended view. And the frog leg view of the other leg doesn't help us in this scenario. So, um, but anyway, um, just wanted to at least cover that for us. And then this is his FHO. So <clears throat> what I love about this whole Zoom thing I'm finding is that I don't actually need to, uh, uh, to entertain any of the uh, uh, peanut gallery commentary from, from my very well-respected radiology colleagues out there. So um, anyway, let's take a look at your guys' Q&As. Let me see. Actually, it looks like I don't have any. Does anybody want to actually throw in any last minute questions to type through? Because if not, I'm just going to go ahead and pass the mic off to, uh, to Dr. Tawson. Again, I apologize for um, our loss of, uh, of connectivity there in the beginning. I'm hoping that we've got it figured out now. Um, but uh, all right, I'm not really seeing any questions coming. Oh, here's one. Oh, thank you. All right. Well, I appreciate that. Appreciate that. Um, here's, a, here's a bunch of questions coming up. All right, let's do this. Um, the fractured digits, do they tend to have a higher incidence of neoplasia later in life? Um, you know, there's a, in theory, I can see how that could be possible because anything that incites chronic inflammatory response definitely could uh, lead to higher incidence of neoplasia. Um, in all honesty, I have to tell you, I, I, I haven't really heard that in the literature, though, officially. Um, but I, I think the theory could make sense um, if you leave something that might have, like something that actually becomes a chronic um, uh, non-union, if that represents a continued source of, um, of chronic irritation, then I can see theoretically how that could lead to neoplasia. But if a fracture goes on to heal, um, just with a malunion, then I don't really necessarily expect that to cause any higher incidence of cancer later on in life. So, another question, how often would you suggest a digit removal with a fracture? Um, basically, uh, client expectation. Um, and so the, with the client expectations, it's sort of like if, if they just want to be over and done with it in two weeks, I'm going to go ahead and amputate that digit. You know, I mean, some clients know that you, you give them the prediction that you're, that you're gonna manage this with a splint for 10, 12 weeks and it still might be a non-union, you know, then that client might wanna proactively pursue um, the removal of the digit right up front. Um, but I guess I, I would say that most clients that we come across wanna give their dog the benefit of the doubt and they are willing to at least try the several weeks of the splint management because they do know, I try to tell them in the beginning, in the end, if it fails, then we can always remove the digit later. So many clients are fine and game with trying the splint management and seeing how it goes. But other clients, when you tell that to them ahead of time, they've got a crazy Labrador that there's no way that they're gonna be able to restrict that dog for 10 weeks. They say, forget that doc. I just want, I just want to be over and done with this in two weeks. That, that client totally will elect for an amputation right away. All right, did you bandage for the conservative management of the tibia tuberosity avulsion? Yeah, that's a good question. You can, um, depending on your prowess in putting bandages and splints on a stifle. Um, so that might be dependent on the shape of the dog. That might be dependent on the size of the dog. Um, it's true, in order to actually, uh, to stabilize that tibia tubercle fracture, uh, after you've uh, either after you've repaired it or if you've chosen for conservative management, you'd have to keep that stifle in extension. And I think all of us have tried putting a stifle in a bandage in extension before. And depending on the shape of the dog, that triangular shape of the leg, 
just pushes that bandage down to the foot and, and never survives. And so it begs the question as to how practical it is to try. Um, sometimes if you actually apply the splint, you know, say for example, the full length of the leg, maybe on the cranial aspect, um, you might be successful. Um, but I might also make the argument that for the, for the period of time, most of these avulsion fractures happen in juvenile patients. And for the period of time that you'd need to manage that splint or that bandage, you know, that, that thing's gonna be healed in the amount of time that you're fiddling with it anyway. And you might run the higher risk that if your bandage does drop down to the ankle, that you'll actually cause a fulcrum effect and, and incite it to displace. So, so that's a long-winded answer, a long-winded way of me saying I almost never do it. So, um, sent you a question yesterday. What's your pain protocol for these procedures? You use Noceta a lot. Your thoughts of it on its efficacy? So, what I will say, um, thanks, Gwen. Um, what I will say is that I, you know, Noceta. I, I'm not, I think I do get a good response in most of my cases. Um, it's it's going to be hard for me to tell for sure whether or not there are there is such a thing as good batches and bad batches of Noceta as to whether or not some batches work better than others, um, because I'm more inclined to sort of self-deprecate and wonder whether or not I injected it correctly um, in the right spots, you know. Um, because uh, the, although the amount of Noceta that you can give um, is copious, it, it doesn't always allow you to completely imbibe the entire surgical field uh, with numbness. Um, and so I, I find that probably kind of like what you hear anecdotally in women that get uh, epidurals for their pregnancies, um, some of them take and some of them don't. Um, I just find that with Noceta, more often than not, it takes. Um, and then occasionally I get, you know, just variations on how well it takes on any given patient. Um, obviously our pain protocol is much more than just the Noceta. Um, I mean, I think I can say across the board that we're, we're still trying to do epidurals, uh, locals kind of like Noceta. We are still giving narcotics. Um, we are still doing cryotherapy, post-operative, laser therapy, post-operative. We are still doing lots, basically everything we can possibly do um, with the patient's health health allowing, you know, NSAIDs, all that sort of stuff, gabapentin, uh, everything we can throw at the dog, um, we're throwing at the dog. So. Do you have any recommendations to minimize skin irritation with a splint? Um, my last one had a really good client, but we still ended up with some skin sloughing at the top of the splint. Yeah, that is a problem. So um, in some of these cases, depending on the circumstance, yeah, that's the time that you just simply might need to abandon the splint management. Um, but uh, uh, no, I mean, I think the best way to minimize the skin irritation is to try and pad it enough so that the hard material isn't reaching the skin, um, which is usually the biggest, uh, you know, the biggest perpetrator is, is, is the hard material portion of it. Um, it's also the tightness over the bony prominences. So, um, you know, how tight you're making your, ca your cast padding over the bony prominences um, which is obviously just the basics also of sizing the correct size of splint as well. So no, I mean, I think with the best of us, to be honest with you, the best of us do run into to bandage splint problems. In fact, that expectation that any dog is going to be able to even last eight to 12 weeks without running into bandage sores is highly optimistic. I'm usually expecting bandage sores to occur right around seven or eight weeks. Um, and so sometimes I'm almost always having to abandon those sooner rather than later. Um, I'm going to have to say, I'm going to try and answer these last few questions um, as quickly as I can. I want to move on to Mike's talk uh, next. I would say that after this period of time, um, if we don't, if I don't have time to answer any further questions, then you guys are certainly welcome to, uh, I can pawn them off on Mike after his talk, um, or, uh, or you're certainly welcome to call us all the time, anytime with questions. Um, and. Uh, and we'll try and we'll try and get them answered. You can email us with those questions, and we'll email you back. Um, that's kind of what we're here for. So now, can you, uh, what about joint issues with pins being in for an extended period of time? Yeah, it's a good question. So yeah, the the assumption would be that those for those digit fractures, that since we have to penetrate the joint in order to put them in, and then we remove those pins, you're absolutely right. We do probably have to warn the owner that those digits might be prone to some degenerative changes as life goes on in life. Uh, but from a, for all intents and practical purposes, we find that that's not really a big deal for the dogs. It doesn't seem to change their overall 
quality of life, the, the, the expected DJD they'll get in those digits uh, usually doesn't amount to, to, to much of anything that they ever report back to us. So, uh, For complete fracture of the femur, do you still apply a temporary splint before surgery? Um, when, when the splint can't actually stabilize the fracture site as it can't stabilize the joint above? Yeah, that's an awesome question. Uh, I almost never splint femur fractures. I, I guess, let me amend that. I never splint femur fractures. So um, I guess, uh, you know, it's probably just as well to, to basically, um, you know, let the dog be three-legged and just support him with a lot of um, pain management for the purposes of transport between the time that you see them and the time they actually come get to us. So that's a great question. Uh, what would happen if Rainer had no surgery treatment? So if the femoral neck fracture just let mother nature take its course, the, the likelihood and expectation is it just turns into a fracture uh, non-union. Um, and if it's a fibrous non-union that isn't really affiliated with much discomfort, the cat might be fine and just might be slightly awkward. Um, I guess only time would be able to tell that. And so if that's something that the client is considering, um, it's true you could give them the, the big plus about that is you can always wait. You know, there's never a window of opportunity that you have to pursue an FHO for. And so uh, that would totally be fine to try. You can always do the FHO later. Um, as a veterinarian managing the case, you'll just certainly have to stay on top of the pain management while Mother Nature's trying to do what it's going to do. So reasonable question. So with that question, I'm just going to uh, cut the questions off at this point and try and pass it off to Mike. Um, and, uh, and then we'll see what further questions. Feel free if you want to still ask questions, they can, we can continue to, to address them, but I kind of want to see if I can't get Mike uh, on board here. All right. Thanks for listening. Thanks for taking your time out of a busy day. Um, I have a couple cases here to go through, uh, actually about three of them, but we'll see how many we get to um, and then move on from there. Uh, now these first two cases are actually a little different, throwing in a little bit different uh, curveball. They're actually cases that we don't really see here anymore, but uh, with our previous years of experience and other things, I think they're very practical um, and definitely some, you know, keys of words of wisdoms for those cases that hopefully if they're ones you see uh, out there in practice to make your life a little easier and maybe some things that I thought, uh, you know, I wish somebody told me that 20 years ago would have made my life a lot easier on some of these cases. So. Uh, but yeah, our first one, we're just going to dive right in here, uh, is Scooter, eight-year-old uh, Shih Tzu type mix or uh, Shih Tzu with a really on and off strain to urinate. Uh, so male neutered, uh, presenting uh, to the referral clinic for some discomfort and on and off intermittent strain to urinate. No other clinical history or records or health problems. And so the physical exam, you know, not too exciting, uh, a little tender on the abdomen, Definitely a large sort of distended bladder, what seemed to be. Um, but the rest of it, and even a little preliminary blood work was performed, was normal. Uh, so still systemically uh, in very good condition. And so x-rays were taken, and this is uh, what they showed us. And so in looking at these, you know, obviously always look at, you think of why are we straining? And, you know, this case obviously pretty apparent why, why he was straining. Uh, but uh, you first just take a look at the bladder and you see a large bladder uh, with stones in it. Well, obviously the stones in the bladder aren't causing this. Uh, you, know, you see those dogs that are straining due to secondary UTIs, other things have a very small bladder. So this definitely looks like an obstructive bladder, which you see you know, going up the urethra there, many, many stones uh, sort of you know, running up as a little trail up in the, the urethra there. So now becomes where I'm just going to show you this slide. This is not the same patient, but I wanted to bring this up at this time uh, because uh, I've seen definitely some people getting confused or we don't take a good enough x-ray back in this region because where do most of these male patients get obstructed is right behind the os penis here. So uh, if we don't get a good enough x-ray or get burnt through these tissues too much or the legs are in the way, we can definitely get confused or we can miss some of these stone uh, areas such as this one here. The other thing is this x-ray shows us is the fabella looks very similar to a stone. So if you accidentally get uh, this stone line or this leg lined up here, uh, definitely you can uh, uh, trick yourself of having something back here causing issues. We'll move on to Scooter here 
And so we say, what's next? Um, and then I guess in this circumstance, is full anesthesia necessary? You know, the answer is absolutely. Uh, there's absolutely no reason not to anesthetize Scooter. He's, his blood work was normal, his physical exam's normal. We want full relaxation um, at that time while we're doing anything else. So positioning and prepping, uh, what do I do? Well, I normally put them on their back, uh, get everything sort of sterilely prepped around the prepuce area. And then what equipment are we gonna use? Well, uh, typically use red rubber catheters and the size of catheter is very important. And that's where I bring up this little equation here uh, where obviously from your physics before an undergrad, you know, you've probably seen this equation, I'm sure you all remember, but uh, what this is actually showing is that the radius of your catheter is huge. Uh, everything else uh, really makes minimal pressure change that you can make a, through a tube, but the radius will for, for, for fold uh, or four fold increase what you can do. So, uh, you know, just small changes in that. And so in a, a male dog is a rarity I ever pull out a fried French red, uh, rubber catheter. And that's why, you know, most of the, even though this is a smaller patient, 100% eight French red rubber uh, to try to get in there because the amount of force you can push through that is much better. And then you think of, well, what surgical procedures are our ultimate goal? Uh, to me, there's only one ultimate goal anytime we have a male with a lower urinary tract obstruction, and that's going to be uh, a cystotomy. Uh, it's uh, rare that we have to, uh, would have to perform a urethrotomy uh, and have that uh, type of surgery. And so almost all of these dogs will have some form of cystotomy. Uh, I bring up this diagram here because it's sort of this historical you know, diagram, how we deal with stones and male dogs. But to be honest, I think it's a little outdated because one, stones don't really get stuck up in this region. And the other is putting your rear or finger in the rear of a dog to help flush back a stone. You know, it's not typically my treatment of choice. And I'm gonna to talk to you why uh, that is, is because, well, when you look at the anatomy, we said the stone gets stuck here behind the os penis. Well, why am I having you put your finger clear up here? Well, what I typically do is I put the catheter in up to the obstruction and then flush back all those little trailer stones that were uh, that were on the uh, behind the obstructing stone, and then to actually dilate the urethra, I have an assistant put their hand here to occlude the urethra sort of at the base of the scrotum because that's going to give us a lot more less segmental dilation of the urethra and it really uh, relieves most of the obstructions, also keeps any fingers from being in the rectum while you're doing this. So it's a much cleaner aspect and a much easier aspect to get to. So this is just a diagram of where the assistance really is holding off. So, and looking at this picture here, um, you can see the os penis probably ending about here. And, um, they're just holding off right at the base of the scrotum there. And so that's exactly what we did with Scooter. Uh, you can see that's a fairly sizable catheter on radiographs. And so I'm guessing that's an eight French uh, catheter in a five or six kilogram patient. Um, and all the stones go back into the bladder as we had planned. I always document that I got them back in there because I don't want any unpleasant surprises at surgery. Um, and so then you think of, well, are we done yet? Uh, well, almost. So then we Proceed on with the cystotomy, remove the multiple stones in this case, uh, flushing of the urethra multiple times. What I mean by that is that surgery, you know, I flush the urethra from both directions to ensure 100% that the stones are removed. Um, and then yes, uh, sort of routine bladder closure. And then when this is all said and done, 100% recommend an x-ray. If this is a radio pig stone going into it, uh, you definitely want to take an x-ray because what those percentages below represent are actual cases of patients that have been missed. So 14% when somebody went back into the study of uh, stones and dogs that were removed, uh, there was 14% of dogs that had stones left behind when they took post-surgery x-rays and cats is up to 20%. So I think it's essential uh, to take these x-rays if they're radio opaque stones to ensure that the job's been complete and we know exactly where we're starting, uh, especially down the road since so many of these are potential chronic st stone formers and chronic issues here. And so I'm gonna move on to, uh, I forgot about this slide here, but this is just another uh, sort of just quick slide of what happens if you put your catheter in, you hit resistance, but you don't actually find anything on your survey x-rays. 
Well, a urethrogram is a very easy type of radiographic test that can be done if you have any type of sterile contrast in the hospital. Uh, most of the time you can dilute this contrast down greatly. It does not have to be at full strength because it shows up very nicely in the urinary tract. Um, and those are just some small recommendations as, as far as volumes. But the big things you wanna do is not get air bubbles in your catheter when you go to inject this. Uh, you really place your catheter in just in, into the tip of the, uh, the penis there and then just occlude with uh, atraumatic, uh, a lot of times just an atraumatic force up there while you inject so it doesn't leak back out at you. And then take the film, you're gonna have to be gowned up and gloved up and you almost always do this from lateral positioning, but take the film right at the very end of injection because that's when the urethra will be the fullest. And so that's just a little tip on, you know, a urethrogram and some guidelines there. Um, and just off to the right here, this is just a, a, a normal urethrogram um, there. So our second case, we'll keep going as uh, we only got about 10 minutes left here, uh, is Cookie, which is a five-year-old female spade uh, Shih Tzu mix, which I know everybody's excited. Um, oh, we have a question here. Let me see, I'm getting signal that we'll get a question. All right, the question is, do you have intraoperative RG or do you close up and go to x-ray? So that's a very good question. We do not have intraoperative radiographs at this time. And so yes, uh, always close up and go to x-rays. Uh, to take our films at that time. Yes, it would be great if you had the ability to take intraoperative, but uh, you know, by the time you have the abdomen open and you're trying to struggle with radiology equipment, uh, to be honest, I find diligent surgical technique and not in actually looking and flushing and getting the stones out that way, that those percentages are probably uh, very overrepresented of what I've ever seen in the cases that I've done. Uh, but I definitely recommend getting those x-rays. But yeah, most of the time that's after uh, we have the abdomen closed and can head to radiology. Um, and so then case two here, uh, we'll get going here on the, the second case. Uh, so this is a female spade uh, patient that's straining to urinate, has partial anarchy, a little intermittent vomiting here recently. And again, no other health problems up to this point in time. But yeah, it's, oh, there we go. It was just sort of frozen up there. Um, but physical exam, you know, again, a moderately distended abdomen, a discomfort on the caudal aspect of the abdomen. Um, you know, all these urinary tract cases, I think doing a rectal exam is extremely important uh, and uh, is very part of the physical exam that needs to be performed with any type of urinary tract straining or not. And the male patient, obviously on that previous one, a rectal exams, check them for prostate size and a smaller dog like that, you should be able to fill that. Uh, any other abnormalities. And so a little bit of blood work is performed, which showed a little bit of a neutrophilia uh, and a stress leukogram. And so this is our, our initial survey x-ray. So this is again, you know, we can definitely see obviously the stones in the bladder. However, uh, you know, the bladder to me shows to be obstructed. These stones are not the culprit, unfortunately, when your bladder looks like this. So then you start looking, well, where does the female urinary tract run? And it's uh, running right down in this region here. Well, still don't see much, but this is why you always take two view x-rays because when you look at this film here, um, you can see there's a large calculi that's stuck right in the, the first or proximal part of the urethra. And so in a female dog, you know, and this is why I didn't tell you what I found on my rectal exam is because I actually was looking in this area on my x-ray purposely because on rectal exam in a small patient like this, I could fill that. And so I had a pretty good idea. I was gonna find something in that area. And so the rectal exam's key, especially on a female dog because you can fill a very large part of the urethra for any type of thickening um, and any type of hard or firm stone objects in that region. And so, with these x-rays and a rectal exam, we have a urethral obstruction due to a single large stone. Well, now what do we do? And that's where we look at our anatomy and try to figure out what are we going to do? And you know, obviously going back to the male patient, we wanna get the stone back into the bladder. And so it's no different with our, with our female patient. And so we're going to uh, catheterize them uh, by, and the classic setup I use or equipment I have 
would be using an otoscope. Uh, almost everybody has this in their practice. Now, typically we would keep some of these tips sterile and try to do this as sterile as possible. You always start with a sterile catheter, lots of lube, which I didn't uh, mention on the, the male patient, but definitely you wanna use lots of that. And what I'm doing is actually visualizing the papilla uh, when I catheterize. And I've actually passed my scope right through the otoscope itself uh, to ensure that I get into the spot I wanna be. Once I get it in there, then typically in the female dog, it goes back much easier because I have a much bigger urethra. So again, very large catheter. A small female patient like this, uh, most time thinking at probably around a 10 French red rubber catheter, something big. I've found most of the female patients, you'll actually just push the stone back with the catheter. You don't even hardly need any flush in a bunch of these patients. Um, and so, you know, very basic setup. And, you know, that's exactly what we did in this patient, where you can see here's post catheterization and the catheters as wound up into the bladder there. And then this is the pre catheterization with the stone in that region. And so then went in and did the cystotomy and uh, uh, took the stones out. And then obviously always took, um, and then the big thing, I, I guess I put this slide here. This is why it's essential to take those x-rays beforehand. This is impossible to catheterize a female patient at the time of surgery, because with them on their back under drapes, I would say is almost next to impossible. So in these patients, I actually leave this catheter in until I get into surgery to take those stones out. And then I have an assistant uh, slowly back that out once I've removed almost all the stones to make sure that that stone didn't fall back in there. Because if I wait and say, oh, I'm just gonna get it back in at surgery, like a lot of the male dogs, you can catheterize easy. A female patient, you're not gonna be able to get catheterized under a drape. Um, let me see, I'm getting a couple questions here. Uh, and so one question, what's the potential for urethral rupture in a severely obstructed dog during flushing? Uh, is there a significant risk? I would say in dogs, the risk is extremely low. To be honest, I've never ruptured a urethra in a dog while I'm trying to catheterize, knock on wood or knock on something. Now cats, different story. Obviously, if you're, especially if you're using polypropylene catheters and sharper catheters, but I'd say the risk is extremely low and I've never seen it rupture from too much force by putting, put that way in a patient that's obstructed by stones or other things. Now say we're trying to flush something back and they had a you know, cancerous urethra or something else or a cancerous prostate, then yeah, I think some of those uh, weird obscure things could happen, but uh, yeah, it's very uncommon. Um, and then another question was, do you ever decompress by cystocentesis uh, to flushing the bladder if it's very large. It's a rarity. Uh, if it's extremely large and it just feels like there's way too much pressure. However, I will typically try to um, at least once flush, not with large volumes or anything like that. Um, and so those are the things that, um, uh, that we would be uh, doing there. But yeah, it's uh, you know, I do not typically do a cyst on a lot of these patients unless they're just extremely obstructed with high pressure, but that's a rarity. Um, another one is, do you use sacrococcygeal blocks? Uh, typically not using any type of blocks, but obviously with any of these things we just talked about, we're using full anesthesia with pre-medications and then plus or minus epidurals um, at that time. But yes, typically not just blocking uh, the perineal or back region in most of these cases. All right, well, I'll move on here. Since we only have a couple minutes, it looks like I'm gonna you know, miss my last case, which was a little bit more of an orthopedic case, but that's fine. Um, and then, yeah, as far as that, I guess I was almost at my question screen there. Um, and so, you know, with that being said, it looks like we're just a couple minutes before one o'clock. Um, I'll sort of make it through all um, let me just get to my end of my thing here and open it up to any more questions if anybody else has any other questions. Otherwise, uh, you know, we want to really, you know, again, like Alex has mentioned earlier with Liz and Alonco, we really want to thank them for their support and all their support they've given us. Obviously, want to thank you guys. Uh, we wouldn't be doing this without your support uh, and being out there and, and helping refer the cases to us and, 
and those things. And I don't want to confuse you. I mean, I presented those urinary tract cases because I thought they were very, you know, good words of wisdom and other things. But unfortunately, those are cases we're not doing a ton of at this stage. Um, but, uh, you know, just wanted to throw those out there because I thought they're pretty practical. Um, and then let me look here. It looks like I got a few more questions um, and see. So, but, uh, and then if one question here, how often do you see stones that are not radiopaque? To me, I'd probably say less than 10% of the time. Um, you know, most of them will at least get enough mineral opacity uh, that will um, at least be able to pick up on those. Um, and so, and, and those type of things. So, um, but yeah, I guess uh, I'll sort of leave it as that. Uh, any questions keep trickling in. We'll obviously uh, get back to you guys here and I can type some of those in then too. Uh, but yeah, it was, uh, you know, thanks for hanging in with our first virtual CE. You know, a little awkward for sure, but, uh, you know, working out the technical difficulties. You will be getting uh, an email from us uh, likely in the next uh, few days, one with the certificate for the CE. Uh, the other is uh, with a survey of what you think we can improve on. Uh, what would you like recommendation wise? You need to be honest, this case presentation, we sort of want to open it up to you guys. If you have interesting cases, I know on our invites this time, it was sort of a first time deal, but you know, there are a link where you could send us in some interesting topics or cases that you may want us to uh, you see if we can fit in and, and get those going then too. So uh, again, thank you. And uh, yeah, have a very good day.